Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from my news up here at Desawe Kanda. I am Alfred Akansi. Tonight, COP Alex Mensa and two other police officers interdicted for their involvement in the alleged plot to oust the IGP. Dr. George Akufo Dampari, we explore the legal and security implications with an expert panel tonight. There's an interesting development in this case. You want to stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. Also, the National Democratic Congress and four other political parties have dragged the Electoral Commission of Ghana to the Supreme Court over some unresolved issues surrounding the planned voter registration exercise. We're going to hear from the concerned parties tonight. Well, the Black Stars have secured qualification for the next Africa Cup of Nations after they recorded a 2-1 win over Central Africa Republic at the Babayara Sports Stadium in Kumasi. We assess the form of the team and also delve into the matters relating to the GFA upcoming elections. Some issues are happening there. And lots of you had a lot to say about the first half performance of this team. We're getting to all of that and let's hear from you as always. We're very, very interactive. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The National Democratic Congress, together with Convention People's Party, Old People's Congress, Liberal Party of Ghana, and Great Consolidated People's Party, have headed to the apex courts to stop the limited voters' registration to be carried out by the Electoral Commission. Among others, the parties are of the view that the Electoral Commission's decision to restrict the centers of voter registration to their district offices may deprive many eligible voters of their rights to be registered as voters and to vote in public elections. The Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Dr. Sam Jonah, has urged the public, particularly politicians and public office holders, to voice their concerns about corruption. He was addressing the 2023 annual general meeting of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana in Takrade. <music> Residents of Nima in Accra are concerned about the Yawaso East Municipal Assembly's notice to demolish their polyclinic for an Agenda 111 health facility. They fear to suffer a similar fate to La Residence, whose community hospital is yet to be redeveloped three years after it was pulled down. <laughs> The same way they demolished the La General, Trade Fair and Co. So we are worried. The hospital is important, but they shouldn't keep long in building it to avoid issues. We are not happy with the previous demolition, and so are we with this one. They are not straightforward. It's their structure, and they have decided to demolish it. I have nothing to say. Farmers along the White Volta in the northern parts of the country have begun harvesting their food crops prematurely. This is due to the Bagre Dam spillage from which thousands of hectares of farmlands are already submerged. This is our fate as farmers along the White Volta. We couldn't salvage anything except this maze in front of me, which has also rotten. I'm compelled to harvest my maize, though they are not fully matured. Bank of Ghana has requested ECOWAS member countries to be realistic with the 2026 deadline for the launch of the ECO, as no member state has been able to meet all four primary criteria of convergence. Head of research at the Bank of Ghana, Philip Abredu Otu, has called for a readiness assessment of the single currency in 2027, despite the challenges faced with its implementation. While this performance is worrying, it is not surprising, given the challenges 
the region has faced over the past three years. That notwithstanding, a concerted effort is required to help improve our macroeconomic environment and place the region on a stronger convergence path. Oh, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, COP Alex Mensa and two other uh, police officers interdicted for their involvement in the alleged plot to have the president remove the IGP. Dr. George Akufo Dampari, we explore the legal and security implications with uh, an expert panel tonight. Well, the police council has interdicted the COP George Alex Mensa and two others. But before I show you the statement and some issues playing out tonight, really interesting. Take a listen to COP Alex Mensa when he appeared before this seven-member committee established by the Speaker of Parliament to probe this leaked audio tape. One of the topical issues that he, he's talked about. Take a look. What I said yesterday, if you give me the chance today, I will say so again. He is not managing the police service well. And for me, for the 31 years that I've been in the service, I can tell you he's the worst IGP we've ever had in this country. Well, in fact, the day before today, that, that, that particular day that he had made this statement, he had indicated that in his view, the IGP was not mismanaging, in fact, was not managing the Ghana Police Service well. Fast forward, now, this morning, we woke up to the news of the interdiction of COP Alex Mensa, Superintendent also JB, and then also the third person involved in this, Superintendent George Asari. Now, Section 82 of the Police Service Regulations 2012, that's CI 76, provides for the major offenses within the service that interdiction can, can be also um, applied. I'm going to show you that slide right now and just to put issues in context so you understand exactly how things have played out. Now, take a look at this. This is what the law specifically says in the Ghana Police Service. Police Service Regulations 2012 CI 76. The major offenses, it is a major offense for an officer to, one, assault a fellow police officer, use without license, authority, any property or facilities of the service for a purpose not in connection with official duties. They also talk about engaging an activity outside official duties, which is likely to involve the officer in political controversy. Look at that, political controversy, or lead to the officer taking improper advantage of that officer's position in the service. In fact, there are a number of offenses, including drinking on the job, sleeping on the job, all of that are captured in there as well. But the emphasis is on the, the political involvement in there. But I want to show you exactly what the details of this interdiction notice was. Um, by the Ghana Police Service. We're going to put that on the screen right now. Um, they've been asked, all these three persons, to surrender their weapons. Take a look at this. This is what the statement said. And uh, says the police service inter has interdicted COP Alex Mensa, Superintendent Emmanuel Eric JB, and Superintendent George Lassander Asari, in connection with the audio tape which has become a subject matter of investigation by Parliament. The interdiction is to make way for disciplinary proceedings into their conduct in line with the police service regulation, which I just read to you. This was signed by Grace Ansa Akrofi. So you understand the, the, the law that the, 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 they dwelt on to take this decision of the interdiction. Now, Bobby Bansing is private legal practitioner. He's been following this case quite closely. Also, Dr. Ishmael Norman is a security analyst. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. I'll start off with you, Bobby Bonson. When this interdiction notice was 
made public, one of the reactions is that the timing, the issue about the timing, and then also the fact that this interdiction might be interfering with the process that Parliament has initiated. That is, this seven-member committee's probe into it. Does this interdiction interfere with the parliamentary process in any way, as uh, COP Menses' lawyer has also indicated? Good, good evening, um, Mr. Okansi, and thanks for having me on your, on your show. Right. Um, I, I think that the, the answer to this question lies in interrogating the, the legal scope and authority of the parliamentary probe. Um, because you are speaking about or you are making reference to whether or not the interdiction in any way interferes with the probe in parliament. Um, that would have been easily answered if there was no doubt as to the legal effect or consequences of the probe from parliament. And so the question is, the parliamentary probe, probe what are the authorities or the powers that the parliament would have beyond undertaking this pub public inquiry. In other words, at the end of the probe, can parliament on its own remove the IGP? Can parliament on its own remove these three officers? Are police officers subject to direction of members of parliament in the ordinary work of carrying out their duties as parliamentarians? Or the enabling act, either the Police Service Act or the provisions of the 1992 Constitution, intends to create Parliament as an independent state entity um, for, to all intents and purposes. I do not think that Parliament would have any enforcement powers when it comes to whatever finding they arrive at as a result of this probe. To that extent, legally, the interdiction by the Ghana Police Service, and we, we, we all know that it's definitely at the instance of the IGP because of the uh, um, ranks of the persons involved. The interdiction by the Ghana Police Service, the optics do not look good because to the lay person, it's sort of prejudicing the outcome of the, the probe. But legally, I do not see how it will conflict or it will be in contempt of the parliamentary um, hearing as we are currently facing on the on on the on the basis that parliament will not have that authority to remove any of these officers and so the officers are still subject to their code of ethics as 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 police officers and so strictly speaking in the legal context i do not see how the decision to inter interdict these officers um, um, would breach any any parliamentary privileges or any um, authority of parliament. Um, that said, whether or not it was proper for the interdiction to be at this time is, right. is another question. In fact, it is the, the timing bit that I'm going to stay with you on. The interdiction is one of many disciplinary measures, as we saw in the law, that the police can initiate. So what is the issue with the timing? of this particular interdiction in this case? Well, you know, like we, we say when um, the constitution or any act gives powers to any person, that power must be exercised um, in the best interest or the discretionary exercise of power must not be arbitrary. Now, that is a constitutional provision. Now, whether the argument can be that the, 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 the leaked tape being the basis of the said interdiction. When did the office of the police service or the IGP, for lack of a better word, when did the IGP get hold of this leaked tape? Has the IGP invited these persons or has the police constituted an internal probe to be able to come to the conclusion that they came to? Um, the, the, the legal effect of interdiction, it's, it's like a lemma would say, step aside pending um, interrogations, or sorry, investigations. Now, is the police going to investigate in addition to what 
the parliament is doing because the interdiction is not a punishment in itself. The interdiction is not a punishment in itself. It, it, it's more or less a step aside pending us conducting a hearing into the matter. So if the police has decided to ask these persons to, set us, to step aside, it means by law, the police are asking them to step aside pending conclusions of investigations. Does it mean that the police service has already started a parallel investigation with that of parliament? Or they are about to start a parallel investigation with that of what parliament is doing? If that is the case, then why are the police officers appearing before parliament? Remember, there's been clamor, and I support that call, for the IGP himself to appear before parliament. If parliament is actually saying that they are on a fact-finding mission, every person that is mentioned or affected in that tape must appear before it. The IGP has been mentioned. Now, parliament is going to ask the IGP to appear before it. Now, the IGP, by this act, is telling the whole world, well, we are also going to investigate this matter. Where, where, where do we draw the line? Why would the state lose resources to, uh, I mean, twice, investigating the same thing? There's a provision of or jurisprudence in criminal law that a person cannot be vested twice for the same offense. So parliament will investigate these people. They have appeared before parliament. They've said something, answered questions. Would they be forced or would they be required or obliged to appear before another investigative tribunal set up by the police? So these are some of the legal questions that may arise from the, from the decision of the police to interdict these officers. I see. I do not think that, uh, well, I do, like I said, I do not think that it conflicts with the parliamentary authority, but whether or not the timing is right, looking at the, 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 the perception or the image that has that from right to the IGP to these officers that have been affected by some of these re alleged conduct, mm -hmm. whether you know there's not yet any proof. I, I, I think that the hierarchy of the police could have could have abided I, I, the, I see. The, 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 the conclusion the, of, parli of, of parliament. But stay with me. Um, lawyer Bobby Bunsen, Dr. Ishmael Norman, so from the security perspective, Bobby Bunsen draws this particular angle of the fact that if the Parliament's committee is going to invite the IGP as another witness or a subject matter in this particular case, but then he, heading the police, have also instituted this interdiction and which is going to lead to investigation of these three persons. Is there a problem there? It is actually not a very effective tool to use when you are doing investigation. Even though systematically the police uh, organization has been using the interdiction. If this is an organization with the capacity to do investigation. So whether you, you interdict the individual or not, he still has a critical mass of supporters in the police force who will speak to him any day, whether he's an interdicted or not. So it doesn't really solve any problem other than the uh, appearance that he's no longer close to the scene of the action to influence the outcome. So it's not very effective, but they use it anyway. The consequences of it, is that the individual uh, doesn't get his full salary. The individual loses a little bit more perks. If he's, uh, he had access to vehicle, he won't be able to do that, petrol allowance and all of that. In our country, these things are very important to a certain class of workers. You know, So um, if the conclusion gets to him, he may even lose some of his uh, monuments pensions and, and provident uh, investments and all of that. So uh, it, it, it is, in that sense, it can be very punitive, but uh, for the purposes of investigation, mm -hmm. 
is not very effective. I see. Because uh, in, in, in this in, uh, earlier notice of their interdiction, it was indicated that they should hand over their weapons, their uniform, and other police accoutrements and or properties, including their authority badge to the depot, logistics, their vehicles as well. So you're right on this. But then this interdiction and taking into consideration the committee's earlier notice that a number of other police officers had petitioned them that they wanted to appear before the committee and also have a thing to say about the, the IGP. How is this interdiction going to also impact on this, these number of police officers who are turning up that they want to appear before the committee? Uh, Dr. Ishmael Norman. Oh, it is. It's definitely uh, a preemptive um, strike against anybody who plans to go and provide evidence. Um, this is not good. We, our constitution compels each one of us that is in a position of authority, authority to observe probity, transparency, and accountability. What the move to interdict is not for the benefit of the three. It is actually for those majority that, that may be interested in coming out, police officers, majority police officers, that may be interested in coming out with supporting documentation or statement to support what uh, 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 Cop Asari and, and Mensah have said. It's not a very good thing for Dr. Dampare to have done. If the police board make this decision, it is so not a very good thing because that goes to support some of the allegations that uh, Cop Mensa Asari have been making, that there is no transparency, it is identity politics they play there, and there is no due process, there is no equal protection, and there is no equal opportunity when it comes to promotion, transfer, and a whole host of other things. Particular point uh, that you made. Let's go back and take a listen to uh, COP Alex Mensa, um, a point that he made when he appeared before the committee. And I'll come to you, uh, Bobby Mansing, on the issue about his retirement and if there's any consequential order of this particular interdiction. Take a look. You've indicated that meanwhile this IGP is not correct. What has he done? Honorable Chair, I will not deny that fact today, tomorrow, or the next day. I will make that statement again. That the current Inspector General of Police is not managing the police service well. It's something I will not run away from. I will say it everywhere anywhere that I go. And you can do your own investigations, call police officers underground and find out from them. This man you just saw, a COP Alex Mensa, is expected to retire from the police service next week. In fact, on the 16th of September, because he said it himself when he appeared before the committee that is retiring on the 16th of September. Lawyer Bobby Bansing, so if he's retiring in, in the next 10 days, what would be the consequential effect of this interdiction that the police has just given notice of? Well, the, the, like I said, the interdiction um, means that they are going to um, conduct further investigations. I, I do not think the interdiction will affect his retirement age because his retirement age is a statutory or constitutional provision. Now, when he retires, whether he will be obliged to appear before the, the, the police investigative machinery is another question. Now, when he re, at the time he retired or he retires, if conclusions or the investigations by the police has not been concluded, and there has not been any definite finding of wrongdoing on his part. 
will he be entitled to all the benefits at the time he retired? Or will any unlawful, um, if he's found guilty of any unlawful conduct, will he be applied retrospectively to deny him of any entitlement he may have? So, for example, if he's dismissed, would he have to go without a benefit that would have accrued prior to his dismissal? Those are interesting legal questions that may be asked as a result of how the police service decides to go on with these investigations or whatever conclusions they, they arrive at this investigation. Mm. Bobby Bonson, thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Bobby Bonson is private legal practitioner, he's a lecturer as well. And, and to you, Dr. Ishmael Norman, security analyst gentlemen, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Very interesting days ahead because um, there's already some videos making the rounds on social media and, and which we're also doing our background checks to verify the authenticity of it before we, we put it out. So just to put it on notice, but there's a lot that's happening after this interdiction, and we'll see how the coming days will look like. Coming up next year on Ghana Tonight, the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and four other political parties have dragged the Electoral Commission of Ghana to the Supreme Court over some unresolved issues surrounding the planned voter registration exercise. We're going to hear from the concerned parties on this particular issue, but uh, on your screen shortly, it's the writ that the uh, NDC, together with the Convention People's Party, as you see on the screen, the All People's Congress, Liberal Party of Ghana, LPG, and the Great Consolidated People's Party, GCPP, have headed to the Apex Court to stop the limited voter registration exercise to be carried out by the Electoral Commission beginning the 12th of September, that's this coming Tuesday. Among others, the parties are of the view that the easiest decision to restrict the, the centers of voter registration to their district offices will deprive many eligible voters of their right to be registered and to vote in the public elections. Now, let's establish some basis. There, there's, there's, there's some provision in the law um, which we'll be getting into shortly. And th that's the copy of the writ that you have seen. But the EC, in fact, the, the NDC and the four political parties make reference to various laws in the Constitution. And take a look at this. Article 42 of the 1992 Constitution specifically states, and I quote, every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right to vote and is entitled to be registered as a voter for the purposes of public elections and referenda. That is the basic right in there in Article 42. If you've turned 18 years, you have the right to vote and, and, and no administrative or other circumstances should prevent you from exercising that right. There's another provision as well. Article 45 of the 1992 Constitution talks about the functions of the Electoral Commission says the EC shall have the following functions to compile the register of voters and revise it as such periods as may be determined by law. What we have put in the red zone is what we want to put emphasis on, that the EC is to compile the register of voters and revise it as such periods as may be determined by law. And also they talk about to demarcate the electoral boundaries for both national and local government elections to conduct and survive all public elections and referenda and then also to educate the people on the electoral processing and the emphasis is on E to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters so it is the A and the E that the in NDC and the four political parties are dwelling on Let's go on to, to the telephone now. Dr. Boama Otokono is a Deputy General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, NDC. He's joining us on the telephone. Dr. Boama Otokono, thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. What other reliefs are you seeking from the Supreme Court on this particular issue? Well, as you may already be aware, we have described the approach to the Electoral Commission 
want to use in the registration exercise that is coming up next week. And uh, we have said, for example, that we cannot have registration in the district offices. It would be uh, a scheme that would disadvantage and limit people of their right to um, register to vote in the general election. And mm -hmm. the release that we are seeking together with the other political parties is basically to get the court to rule as unconstitutional the decision of the electoral commission to do the or conduct the registration exercise at the district offices because if you look at the provisions of the constitution as per article 45 particularly closely of the article 45 which enjoins and instructs the electoral commission to put a program to expand the electoral rule. We believe that this approach would be in contravention of that clause because it would not allow the electoral commission to expand the voter rule, particularly when from estimation from the data sources of the Ghana Service Card Service as regards the population census, uh, stipulate some estimated over 3 million Ghanaians that are supposed to register. In actual fact, it's between 3 million to 3.5 million. Because even in 2020, the number of people who attend voting age who were supposed to register was under-registered by some 500,000. So that backlog was there. And from the statistical data, every year we are getting over 1 million you know, Ghanaians who may be turning 18 years and above. And for the last three years, all these individuals have not had the opportunity to register. We believe that any opportunity to get all those individuals registered must be a thorough, you know, uh, registration exercise that will allow all of them uh, to register. If not all of them, at least majority of them to register. But with the current dispensation, we believe that by even the electoral commission's estimations, we will not be able to go beyond a million, you know, of eligible voters. Because now we are putting premium on the registration exercise, such right? that people who come from far distances uh, uh, from the district capital would now be you know, burdened with the cost of traveling uh, long distances to go and register. And not that alone. You are also aware that there has been a problem with the Ghana card in most of those rural areas. So which means that such people would have to get guarantees to guarantee for them to be able to register. So if the person is going to travel for two hours, it's going to travel for 20 kilometers. It's going to travel for 15 kilometers. Go through all the bad transportation systems. He would have to not endure that alone, but endure that with the guarantors as well. And so if you are a guarantor and you are going to guarantee for somebody to register as a voter, and you would have to go through all this test, both economic and, you know, uh, 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 the challenges of transporting and all that, you would, you would find it difficult to accept the person. And we believe this would discourage the majority of people from participating in the exercise, thereby you know, disenfranchising them and taking away their right to exercise their franchise mm -hmm. in any general elections. And so our release, our request of the court is to declare as unconstitutional the arrangements that have been put in place by the Electoral Commission and instruct the Electoral Commission to go according to the regulations of the Public Elections Regulations uh, 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 Act 2016 and the, 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 the that of uh, the CI 126, so that the registration will be sent to a lower, you know, administrative level of 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 of, of the country. In this case, we are talking about the electoral area level, where it becomes a little bit closer to the voters, and it becomes easier for people to transport themselves and go and register, rather than moving it to the district capitals. And we See. anticipate oh. that we, 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 for, 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 for the right. growth of our democracy, for the betterment of our democracy, for the strengthening of, of our democracy, the courts are going to hear our plea. Okay. Well, well. So the, we, we have just six, about five days away from today, including the weekend. So technically, you have three days. So 
if the EC goes ahead with, with this on the 12th of September, what other tools are you going to deploy together with the other political parties to ensure that your concerns are taken into consideration? Because the likes of CDD and CODEO, Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, have all shared in the concern that you're talking about. Well, well, it is our anticipation that with this suit that we have found, the courts would grant us uh, that, that uh, opportunity uh, by, 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 by injuncting the process and getting the Electoral Commission to seize the, the processes and uh, uh, perhaps deal with this matter to the fullest and the determination made by the courts before the process can start. Because we believe that if the process starts, then it's going, it's going to be injurious to the millions of Ghanaians who will not have the opportunity to go and register under this dispensation. Okay. We anticipate that uh, in, the, in the spirit of justice, in the spirit of goodwill, in the spirit of accountability, and in the spirit of democracy, the, 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 that injunction will be granted and the Electoral Commission will be made to all the processes and, and, and the determination of steam uh, done before the processes uh, are, are continued. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Dr. Peter Buama Otokono is Deputy General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, NDC. This is Ghana Tonight. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. There's a lot more happening tonight worth talking about. Stay with us. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? Ha! I'm going to to who is the ultimate energy personality of the year at the seventh edition of your prestigious Ghana Energy Award? Under the theme Ghana's Energy Transition Framework, Sector Institutions has building block for the 2030 to 2040 target. You can nominate yourself or an institution for categories such as CEO of the Year. Energy Investment Impact Award, Energy Signature Award, Endorsement, Validation, Industry Partners, Media Partners, TV3, Ghana Energy Awards, Seven Years of Redefining Excellence. 
as the Ghana's most beautiful competition reaches its peak, the stakes are higher than ever before. With each passing week, the contestants have dazzled us with their grace, poise and cultural prowess. Our contestants step out of their comfort zones and embark on a mission to explore the vibrant African cultures. They will immerse themselves in the heart of other African countries to live, breathe and celebrate their cultures, traditions and ways of life that define our African brothers and sisters. This eviction week, you have the power to support your favorite contestant by dialing star 713 star 13 hush to any network or by downloading the TV3 reality app. Ghana's Most Beautiful is live this Sunday, only on TV3. GMB 2023 is sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix, GTP, Techno Common 20 Series, AT, Pepsodent Charcoal and Lemon Infused Formula and Pepsodent Natural Herbal Formula, Geisha Moringa and Geisha Black Soup, Key Soup, Bell Pack Tissues, Sankofa Natural Spices, Vita Milk, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Nescofa Blood Tonic, Heaven Black Mosquito Spray and Coil, Enapa Foods, Freedom from Casa Precon, Frutelli Calipo, Duffy's Health and Beauty, Obuasi Betes, Nubna Womuankasa, Dragnet, Shalatem, Top Choku, Global Wings Travel and Tour. Makeup was done by House of Tara. Donuts on the beat. So it's a matter of flavor, taste, spice, and herbs. This week on Kitchen Wars Season 2. Maoko, Mayoda. We are representing Achimota Senior High School. We didn't come to make noise. We came to show you how it's done. But I see Motown is, is in the building. Right. Got my heart broken by a Motown boy many years ago. Can we give her one? Oh. Okay, okay. Who carries the day for Group G? Let's find out this Sunday, 5 p.m. right here on TV3. My name is Kuti and this is Kitchen Wars. Kitchen Wars! Kitchen Wars Season 2, Sundays at 5 p.m. on TV3. Don't miss it. Sponsored by Gino Tomato Mix. And Napa Foods. Say Napa. And here on Osoko. PGL. Get ready for another cultural explosion like never before. On 21st September, Africa will witness an ultimate celebration of African diversity and flavor at the 3FM Afro Connect event. This is the place to experience the magic of African arts and creativity. You also get to unite in a sizzling jollof war competition, igniting a culinary shoulder. Will Cote d'Ivoire hold the Jollof War title? So whether you're passionate about food, art games, or simply making new connections, 3FM Afro Connect event on the 21st of September is the place to be. Venue, Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park. To sell, call 053-220-0927. 3FM Afro Connect, connecting Africa and beyond. Brought to you by 3FM 92.7. Your Urban Lifestyle Radio. The 3FM Afro Connect is proudly sponsored by... Well, he scored the winning goal, of course, when these two sides last met at the Emirates. Oh, Mike, why did you put the suitcase on top of the wall? No, I can't reach it. Please help. I'm, I'm really sorry about that, okay? I'll take care of it. Welcome, Showbiz 360 on TV3. And this is where everything happens every Friday. Your ultimate stress reliever, Showbiz 360, right here on Friday. Hey, hey, you the guy in the Ghana just make no trial. Don't touch it. I didn't bring you. So, so why do you want to change the channel? Eh? You get one by your body. Nice, babe. And you want to change your channel to football. Why? Why? All right, so cool down with some popcorn and enjoy the wide variety of entertainment we've got coming your way. This is where you kick off your weekend. Fan pack, interesting celebrity convos, you name them, gossips, plus lots of fun activities, all right? Number one, I will just sway. 
Mary Bible Chain. Ain't that a Watch Showbiz 360 Friday at 9 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Black Rock Honey Betway KFC. This week on Today's Woman, our guest is Mrs. Joan Kui Mensa. She's thrived in the real estate industry over the last five years and is still thriving. People think the way the economy is, real estate is going to slow down. But trust me, people are buying properties, people are renting, and real estate is not slowing down anytime soon. She's here to teach us many lessons, especially when it comes to buying properties off plan. But first off, Joan, yeah. off plan, what does that mean? It means acquiring the property before it's built. You get to get the, prop the property at a lower rate. Lower rate. Don't miss today's woman this Saturday, 3 p.m. right here on TV3. My name is Cookie. See you on Saturday. Today's woman with Cookie Tea show Saturdays at 3 p.m. on TV3. Brought to you by Latex Foam. This call. I'm a hero from zero to hero. Many with great voices have taken their chance on the biggest music reality show on screen. Rap na kasa be makaria. Iti Mr. Found to Mamba Media no na yam bam pesi e kakuna bi na ye. Some stood out with their lyrical abilities and style. Mr. Nene Mike na na mama me nene said you won. I say I say man. Mentor is back. The set is on. Who becomes the next winner? Mentor, the world awaits you. you have Donuts on the beat. So it's a matter of flavor, taste, spice, and herbs. This week on Kitchen Wars Season 2. Mauko, Mayoda. Well, coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Black Stars have secured qualification for the next Africa Cup of Nations after they recorded a 2-1 win over Central Africa Republic at the Babayara Sports Stadium in Kumasi. Now, there's an assessment of the form of the team and also delving into matters relating to the GFA upcoming uh, elections. And these are some of the highlights of the match earlier today. Take a look. We're getting to that shortly, and as you see there. So it's a walk forward coming with them. But now, can we see the first goal in the first yellow? Yes, we can. And it is the Central African Republic who take the lead. And of course, it is that man again, Louis Mafuta. It is Kudaso. They're winning the ball back again here, and the referee has a whistle, and there is the winner. That is surely game over, and it is the substitutes combining, Semenyo fighting, and it's Tapia. Ghana lead 2-1, and it's surely now Ghana will be further pleased to finish with three, top the group, and head to the Afcon. It was a nervy win. Oreko Ampofo is uh, with our three sports team here. Oreko, so, I mean, I believe you were the only one sitting on tenterhooks <laughs> when it was 1-1 mm -hmm. 
yeah. and and the, the first half performance. I mean, was that the only one who saw it as shambolic? I mean, where you sat, what happened? Well, I think I think it was erratic, and the the worrying part about it is that if you're a team that you've been consistent and you have a one-off game as such, then you can make that excuse that it was a bad day at the office. Mm -hmm. But this was the fourth game under Chris Hutton, and it's been quite similar with regards to the patterns that we're seeing so far. When we played Angola in his debut game at the Barbera Sports Stadium, once again, the team needed a late winner from Anton Semenyo. Went away, were very poor on the day, and got an equalizer to a moment of brilliance where Joseph Pinto laid on a play for Bukhari and then played a very drab, no no draw away at Madagascar and then today's performance. So, on the basis of the four games that we've seen under Chris Hutton, it's becoming a bit uh, characteristic to see the Black Stars struggle to show any form of cohesion show that they are a unit and most importantly create chances and score goals i see but i saw <coughs> excuse me something to do with the with the, with the keeper mm -hmm. that 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 goal um was it a, a defenders this one yeah came out too early or you would say the defenders were just caught ball watching and and that led to this, this goal i think this this was a very I'm a sure goal to concede, especially because if you look at the person passing the ball there, he had all the time in the world. There was no Ghana player within five meters of him. And that is unacceptable when it comes to high level football. Uh, to be able to give a player that amount of time to think, to pick a pass, is, it shouldn't be allowed at this stage. And to have such space in the middle of the park is something that maybe Chris UT may have to address. But mm. I think that was the first line of error to give the opening that much space to play that pass into. And then uh, there was a bit of a miscommunication with Jiku and um, in the Joseph Edu with regards to handling the runner who mm -hmm. ended up scoring the goal for Central African Republic. I see, but, but how about the keeper as well? Because I'm looking at this mm -hmm. and correct me if I'm wrong, coming out to uh, beyond even his area, the 18, and when he had two defenders running towards this person who was, um, with the ball, yeah, right there. Yeah, did he come out too early? I I think he did what he had to do. Uh, the ball was there to be won. Uh, probably, I think it was just more credit to the striker for getting there first. Although mm. I think it was a bit risky because if the striker went down there, we could have potentially been seeing a red card to Atizigi for you know, being the last one and bringing an opening down when there was a clear goal scoring opportunity. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't really fault him that much uh, because, once again, the cases that I highlighted, I don't think there should be that much space for a player to be playing such a pass uh, into uh, the dangerous area for, for the Black Stars. I see. But go, going forward, I mean, look, look at the, the second goal. Uh, well, there's always had to do with kudos, is it mm -hmm. not? Equalizing <laughs> for, for us. But um, it was a shade of luck. You'd say, <laughs> or, or the second half improvement we saw guaranteed us this, this second goal? Well, I think for, for, for the Black Stars, it was important that they got that equalizer before halftime. And the timing, I think, helped the team mm -hmm. it eased the nerves a bit. If they went in a halftime, a goal down, I think it could have been a different story today. But getting that goal just a few minutes before the break, sort of calmed them down. I think it changed a message from Chris Hutton in the dressing room mm -hmm. and that allowed them to be play with a bit more freedom in the second half. I think getting into the last 10 minutes, that's where we saw the black stars that everybody wants to see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the team that sort of makes people reminisce of the old black stars where it was attack, 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 uh, especially with the introduction of Antoine Semenyo and Enes Nyama, uh, who combined to get the winner for the black stars uh, with just a few minutes to go. So, so that, those second half changes made, made a big difference yeah. for yeah. the team. So was it a strategy or what? Couldn't they have started with that kind of lineup you know, instead of this first half with these players we saw? Well, the thing about coaches and technical teams is that they always have a comprehensive plan. And uh, the game of football is 90 minutes. You're not going to use the same set of players from minutes 1 to 90. And so sometimes you want to preempt stuff that would happen in mm -hmm. games. And so on paper, you know the type of substitutions that you'd make in what game states, in what game scenarios. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think what we have to do is applaud Chris Hutton. Although overall, I don't think it was an impressive performance. 
he was able to still identify the right time to make substitutions. You, you can make good substitutions at wrong times, mm. but I think he made it at the right time. You saw that with Otuado a lot. Yeah, a lot of people criticized that under Otuado, but I think so far he's done really well with that because in the away game against Angola, for instance, mm -hmm. we saw Bukhari come on and you know score the goal uh, that got Ghana the point. Even at home against Angola, when we won by one goal to nil, Semenya came off the bench, and so. Maybe it's a case of easing Semenyo into the team. Nuama is also a very young player, just 19. And it's always a different case when you start a game to when you come on as a sub. Impacting the game as a substitute is not too difficult mm. as compared to when you started from you know, the first minute and you have to play for a longer period and make sure you have your concentration levels really high. Good stuff. Oracle, before we go, beyond this team, the football management body, I'm talking about the GFA. Yeah. There are some issues there, is it not? I yeah. understand the presidential aspirant, Georgia Free, has been disqualified. <laughs> um, not to contest in, in the GFA presidency elections. What happened? I mean, so first off, we know that the elections uh, vetting took place a couple of weeks ago. Um, and they said that they would come back with the results. What we know is that Judge Afri received an email which was put out in the media yesterday that he's been disqualified from uh, the elections. Now, bear in mind, Judge Afri is someone who has been contesting for GFA elections since 2003. Hmm. And so for him to be disqualified, it, it brings some question marks because if you look at the two reasons that the FA are stating, it, it looks a bit unlike him, for someone with that amount of experience, you would have assumed that some form of due diligence would have been done on the application. And, you know, these are very avoidable errors. So for, for the benefit of our viewers, let me just quickly go through the two reasons. So the Good. first one is the fact that uh, before you file your nomination, you need, you need one proposing member and then five supporting members to swear. Uh, that's your statutory declaration. Now, what happened was that Nanaim Ami Almenu, who is of 11 Wonders, uh, was mentioned as one of the people supposed to swear in the statutory declaration. But he wasn't part of the proposing member or the five uh, supporting member list. And so that, in, in essence, means that he, he wasn't a reference in the nomination file because he's not part of the six people who are supposed to swear uh, for the statutory declaration. And so because there's no reference, that goes against the GFA statute. And then the second one had to do with more or less uh, a nomination that um, it took into account that's Jeffrey Asari, mm -hmm. who on paper said that was the director uh, of his club. And so his club was, I think, Victory Warriors FC. And what the GFA did was that they cross-checked on three different levels. And so they looked at the FIFA, uh, they cross-checked with FIFA. Mm -hmm. And then once they checked with FIFA, there was no Jeffrey Asari as the director of that club. That's, uh, uh, you know, I the see. Victory Club Warriors. And then they checked uh, with the club itself. So they spoke with the president on a video call. They spoke with the director. Both of them confirmed that Jeffrey Asari is not the director of the club. And then they called Jeffrey Asari himself on video call on WhatsApp. And Jeffrey Asari right. confirmed that he's not the director of that. And so it's almost like they're So can he appeal this, this? Yeah, he has five days. I five think days one day has appeal. gone by now, so now he has four more four days. days. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> Ore Kwan Pofo, thank you. Thank so you so much for coming by. It's with the three sports team. On behalf of the rest of the team here on Ghana Tonight, thank you for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. I am Alfred Okonse. Have a good night. Superior hiding, <laughs> superior coverage, simply superior.